everyone. Welcome back to the Mind Valley Podcast. I'm sitting here with a remarkable gentleman, Sergey Young. Sergey is a longevity investor and researcher. Sergey, welcome to Mind Valley. Hi, Vision. Hi, guys. So good to see you. And uh, and and Sergey, you know, just to add, we were introduced by Peter Diamandis, um, right. who is one of the foremost leaders and visionaries on the planet today, the founder of the X Prize. And what I love about Sergey's work, which is why I'm bringing Sergey onto the podcast, is Sergey is as an investor for over 20 years. He started a fund called the Longevity Vision Fund. He manages about a hundred million dollars in investment money. And what he's doing is he's been investing in companies promoting human longevity. So this man, Sergey, not only has he been looking at longevity research, but he's been at the cutting edge of new technologies, new startups that could increase human health. Now, Sergey is an innovation board member at the XPRIZE Foundation. I'm a former board member, so we have that in common. And he's a development sponsor of the Age Reversal XPRIZE. What this means is that Sergey has put up and raised millions of dollars to reward to any scientist or researcher that can find a way to reverse aging. And he's known as one of the top 100 longevity leaders in the world and a Forbes Technology Council member. So welcome to, welcome to Mind Valley, Sergey. Thank you. So firstly, let's, let's start. You're 94 years old. You look amazing. Oh, that, look, the beauty of you know, working in longevity sphere <laughs> is that you can really afford yourself to look like a shit, right? It's I, a I, I couldn't see you know exactly what I'm talking face. about. No, how, how old are you really? Yeah, I'm 48. Yeah, but look like for, for 48, I have just amazing amount of energy and it's always <laughs> been the case. So, you know, it's, uh, but then it's okay. only your, side. your accent, I, I know the answer, but tell the yeah. audience, where are you from? Sure. So I'm originally from Russia. But, you know, my main geography is U.S. You know, I love U.S. U.S. is, you know, 300, it's huge homogeneous market, 300 million people, 25% of the world economy, and it's so entrepreneurial. So the, my talent is, is here in U.S. So we're going to talk about two things today. The first thing is, that we're going to talk about is five essential life lessons that coronavirus can teach us. Okay, so Sergey, I'm going to give you the mic. And I'd love for you to share these five lessons. And you so eloquently wrote about this in a, in a Thrive article. And I'm honored to have you share this with our audience. Yeah. Um, thank you. So, um, I mean, obviously, it's a huge stress and unexpected series of events for all of us. And then my, you know, our initial reaction to this is, is always you know, reaction of fear, uh, fear of uncertainty and fear of death. I mean, there's so many things we're doing today, just kind of out of fear of that. And then it was, it took me actually a couple of weeks to regain control and understanding of the situation. And then my, in, in the crisis, and there's, I don't know what this old saying, never meet, never miss a good crisis, right? And then it's always an opportunity to rethink and learn the lessons. So, you know, it was one day a week ago, I just, you know, sit down and thought, why don't I just write, what are the five key lessons that coronavirus teach us today? Not from investment or financial perspective, but for us as human beings. So the, the overall uh, or an overarching theme is what can I learn from this? Um, well, then my reflection number one, and that's, that's the first lesson, is just understanding how fragile our civilization is today and has always been. We got so used to, you know, comfortable life, the existence of job, of economy, you know, and, you know, opportunity to walk on the streets and then don't keep the social distance. So, and we always find a reason to complain. But look, you know, I think it's a huge lesson and huge, you know, huge learning from what has happened in the last month or two is, is just the overall understanding of, you know, how fragile our civilization and then also how responsible we should be in terms of protecting that. So that's, I'll come back to that in lesson five, but that's, that was really striking to lose almost, you know, every degree of comfort in a week or so. And then it, and it took, 
this to appreciate the importance of that. So that's lesson number and, one. And, and I think that's an important lesson there. There was so much to be grateful for, right? Like I used to, I used to dread my commutes to work. Yeah. I'm just not a type, the type of person who could spend 50 minutes in a car going back and forth work. Right now, I long for those commutes. I long for just being able to drive somewhere, anywhere. Sometimes coming back from the grocery store, I deliberately just let my, get, my life, my, myself get lost so I can spend a little bit more time driving and being out of the apartment. Um, but yeah, you're right. There's so much we could have been grateful for. Exactly, exactly. And actually, with my four kids, I do a gratefulness exercise in the end of uh, every day. And first time I asked my nine years son, like, what are the five things you're most grateful for? I actually thought that he, he will struggle to answer, but he was like, one, two, three, four, immediately. So that we lose this kid's ability to appreciate and be surprised with everything that is happening. So that's, but let's come back to, uh, to our lesson. So lesson number two is about what we don't know will kill us. And... It is about our mental model that we kind of, you know, every time we, yeah, I do a lot of, you know, finance and investments and people always ask me like, you know, Sergey, why are you expecting recession? There is nothing bad in the economy. And I said, guys, and it was the last conversation I had, it was back in January uh, 2020 in LA. And I said, guys, I just don't know what's going to be the next trigger for recession, but I can guarantee you. It's not what we experienced in, you know, back in 2008 when it was kind of lending crisis and it was not, it was, will not be the similar kind of tech bubble past which we had back in the year 2000. And, you know, in the end of the day, and it's the fact that we have much more prolonged recession, much more prolonged crisis. It's obviously not kind of V shape. It's best in kind of U or W shape. Uh, so we should, you know, expect the next triggers for crisis and next shocks, obviously not from dimensions that we think uh, we know. So that's, that's a huge lesson for me. And even like- Do you, do you kinda, think, do you think the economy might go down further? Uh, look, it, it, there's a conflict here. I'm like super positive guy, but for you and for audience, I need to tell the truth. So my truth yeah. is we don't even face the, you know, the full consequences of what is happening today because a lot of people are at home uh, and we still haven't seen you know, quarter one reporting. And even like by, by the end of April, there's a number of big tech companies and a lot of US corporation will report. Well, you look at you know, first quarter figures, it's gonna be shocking and then, and it's, it's going to be even more shocking and in, in the second quarter. So we need to be prepared, you know, not for the winter, but might be for the, you know, ice age. But in the end of the day, I think what we learn in the next few weeks, you know, having food, uh, having place to sleep, have an opportunity to educate ourselves and, and people whom we love through kind of online, you know, and even have kind of zoom parties is, is, is just, few things that we need to survive and be happy. Yeah. So the rest, I think, will, will go in, a, in, in much more positive. Uh, and, so, and so the lesson there is prepare for the unknown. Exactly. And even if you think you know like everything, you know, like, you know, I'm taking the huge mortgage and or, you know, I want to buy a house there or, uh, you know, I'm just about to change my life and go into this direction thinking like, mm -hmm. I mean, it's super safe bet. There's no safe bet. So we just... And yeah. every time you, you feel that it's kind of safe and comfortable to make this decision, just prepare that there might be external shock and the source of this external shock would not be from the direction that you actually expect in this. Right, right. So that, that's uh, a no, third life lesson. Yeah. And um, what I, what also, and this is what we discussed prior to uh, this postcard, uh, podcast time is that, I think we're all learning what, what matters the most. And I think the phrase that, you know, money is not everything, right? And money is not kind of super important. Um, we kind of heard this so many times, but we, we, we you know, not necessarily believe in that. 
for right now, when you know health, security, and and the existence of loved ones, you know, became much more important priority. So that's a huge wake up call for us to take control of our health. I just had a chat with um, my friend from New York um, last night, and you know, good friend of his lost two parents last week. You know, his mother uh, passed on Good Friday and father passed on Easter. And it's all, you know, coronavirus, right? And, you know, what can be more important than, you know, taking care of, you know, health and happiness of, you know, ourselves yeah. and the loved ones. And I, and I think it's a huge wake-up call for all of us. We so, we've been, you know, so many times we choose to be in rush for gold. So we actually forgot what the actual gold is. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. You're right. We are learning what truly matters the most. Exactly, exactly. And what I like about our new choice that, that more and more people is taking this time to dig into particular topics, whether it's hobby topic or platform for the next job or something that they wanted to learn from kind of personal development perspective. And then just going online, you know, going through the courses, taking webinars, you know, I think it's been an amazing time to yeah. take care of yourself and you know, think about yourself as a human being, uh, you know, feed your curiosity, intellect, rather than trying to kind of, you know, feed your desire to have more money. Right. Awesome. Awesome. No, that, that's very true. And the cool. thought lesson. Okay. Number four. Um, I remember, so when in the first week of quarantine, I remember the shock and, and overall discomfort that I went through just, you know, being on my own. I mean, I'm with the family, you know, I can, I haven't, still have an opportunity to see my, um, you know, parents and kids, I was, you know, living pretty nearby. But that this, this, this overall shock and the overall step change in terms of, you know, me, being much more comfortable with being on my own. You know, it's not about loneliness. It's just the, the opportunity to, to kind of stay, reflect, to think through the lessons, you know, think how, you know, I want to change my life, you know, afterwards. And I think... The, yeah. I, I, I like what you wrote in your article. It is the act of rediscovering ourselves. Exactly. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's, it's obviously self-discovery. And we're so used to you know, be part of the kind of social life and spend our time with the phones. And I, I, I just looking recently to the latest Barclays report um, on change of generation and habit. Uh, before smartphones, our attention span was like 15 seconds and, um, and goldfish attention span was like nine seconds. But, you know, after, you know, we got into smartphone things, you know, our attention span just dropped down to eight seconds. I mean, it's really unfair. And our mind, <laughs> our body was not really created to live this way. So, and, and then if I want to be grateful to, you know, for what is happening today, I'm grateful for the opportunity to have more thinking time, time for reflection and time for self-discovery. And this is the way I'm trying to uh, approach the kind of current quarantine conditions. Mm. So that's number four. And then number five, um, as I say, um, if um, Greta Thunberg well, you know, was not enough for us to be a wake-up call, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, COVID and, and quarantine is exactly the wake-up call. This is Mother Nature uh, talking to us, saying we should stop our irresponsible behavior in terms of the waste, you know, in terms of the pollution, in terms of not taking care about the kind of global climate and global warming as well. And then funny enough, it took a quarantine in so many countries for the, you know, ozone layer to start to heal itself, right? For you know, timberland growth, for pollution to decrease, right? And for dolphins to come back to Venice, right? To Venice channels. Isn't it amazing? And, you know, obviously we are paying a huge price for that. And then, you know, my final thought is, uh, you know, I've been to South Pole and North Pole. Uh, I mean, even if you think it's risky, it's not that risky. If you compare this to climbing the Everest, 
And I was the Jamalungma, the highest mountain in the world. And at some point of time, I was waiting, you know, trying to wait the probability of death. If, if I will kind of risk myself to go to this, this uh, Everest climbing. And statistic that I found at this time was like 6% probability of, of death. Uh, it's like in take, yeah. yeah. If you, if you kind of go into risk, you know, this risky adventure. I mean, Wuhan, uh, this, you know, this is the town where coronavirus started. Uh, their statistic from coronavirus, you know, shows us almost like 4% mortality rate. So my metaphor for coronavirus today, we all climbing our own personal Everest these days, right? And it's up to us whether we give up or we take this as an opportunity for self-discovery, self-reflection, and learning the lessons. So that's, that's my main point out of it. Amazing. Thank you, Sergey. So one of the things I wanted to ask you is you're a researcher in longevity. So you obviously have been looking at a lot of new technologies, a lot of new yeah. methods for extending lifespans. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious, what are some of the things that that you think we need to be paying attention to if we want to live long and live healthier and live our best lives. Yeah. Okay. So there's two buckets here. And um, one bucket is like boring bucket. I call it horizon two. the things that you can do and you should do today to increase uh -huh. your chances to live longer, like to a hundred years. And like, you know, half of the kids is, is born this year has you know, good chances to live to a hundred years. But that's, right. And while it's boring bucket and it's like, you know, check up, you know, quit smoking, diet, you know, physical exercise, peace of mind. Um, while it's boring, it's super important to act on that. Because if you look at I, statistics, yeah. I, I, I do want to ask you this because we had dinner in Beverly Hills a couple of yeah. months back, right? And, and, and you mentioned something. We get that, okay, sleep is important, that nutrition is important, that hydration, that exercise, that meditation. We've heard that before, but you did share something that was unique to me, which I wasn't paying attention to. Yeah. And that was the importance of regular medical checkups. Yeah, exactly. So let's cover that. that. Yeah, let's cover that. And then if we have time, we can cover, I call it horizon two, like the second bucket. The yes, technologies that. That, yeah, that we're investing in today through Longevity Vision Fund, but it's, it's going to be available for all of us in the next 5, 10, 15 years. So but let's come back to the boring stuff. Well, let's, let's come back to the most important stuff. And, and it is important because you can act today on that. So every time I have 30 seconds on longevity, when people ask me for advice, you know, I spend these 30 seconds about the importance of annual health checkup. If you look at statistics, so yeah, uh, look at coronavirus mortality statistics, or look at the overall mortality statistics. Our killer monsters are cancer, heart disease, and diabetes, right? In 50% of cases, this is, you know, if people are 50 years plus, they're gonna die, you know, from this disease, from these reasons. And if you look at the, where pharmaceutical industry and, and, and health technologies developed itself is that the earlier you, you do a diagnostic of this disease, the higher your chances for recovery. So look at the five main cancer types. You know, cancer, like 20 years ago, cancer was his of death. People were delaying the day when they would knew whether they have cancer or not, because it was automatically mean six months from now. But then mm -hmm. these days, if you look at recovery rates, you know, assuming really early diagnostic of cancer, your recovery rates for main five cancer types are 93 to 100%. Mm. And this is super important. I mean, this is your chance to live high quality life to add 10 to 20 years to your life. And this is super important. And, you know, whenever you do check up, and I do check up uh, every year in Human Longevity Center in San Diego. It's a company established by... Uh, Peter Diamantes, Bob Hariri, and you know, a few other people who I know, you know, pretty well. You know, I'm going for you know, super comprehensive program. You know, I'm spending like six hours of my time, you know, every year going through, you know, super comprehensive MRI. It's full body MRI and doing CT, 
all the different tests. I mean, they, I think they took like 21 blood samples from me uh, when I did this first time. And this is super important because we kind of think, how, you know, disease. How, how often do you do this? How often do you do this check? Every year. Every year, okay? Every year. Now, I now think not it's, all of us are going to be able to go to the Human Longevity Center in yeah. San Diego. What, yeah. what are some checkups that we could find in our local area that you think are important? Yeah, look, I, I think it's, it makes a lot of sense to see your doctor, like a family doctor, and saying, uh, you know, look, you know, I do realize that, you know, heart disease and cancer are, you know, is super important in terms of managing my mortality risk. Why don't we create a program where, you know, I will be able to do, you know, certain procedures to minimize or identify this risk on early stage. And then, you know, every doctor in, in hospital will be There's something unique about Human Longevity Center in California. It just, I see what you're little, yeah. Yeah, and it's, then, it's what Dave Asprey calls the four horsemen, right, of the apocalypse. Yeah. It's heart disease, cancer, um, and diabetes and Alzheimer. Yeah, the fourth one. Alzheimer's. What's, yeah. what's the fourth one again? Uh, so it's diabetes. And Got it's kind of, or it's neurogenerative diseases. Yeah. Got it. Got it. And so we should be, if you are, and I believe you gave me a number, you said after a certain age, we need to be doing a checkup every year for these four things. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Well, now what is that age where it starts getting important? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's not a lot you can do with your health um, in terms of like, you know, something really bad before you turn 25. So for someone who is like below 25, make sure you stick to the good diet, right? Not a lot of sugar, not a lot of processed yeah. food. And obviously, you know, no bad habits like smoking, drugs, you know, consumption of alcohol, uh, excessive consumption of alcohol. So that's done. Between 25 and 40, 45, right? You can do check up like every two years, right? Mm. Because... Yeah, uh, usually we're still in a good state and a good good state and in good shape, you know, in between that. But like after 45, I would strongly advise everyone who can, uh, you know, manage its way through healthcare system, uh, you know, obviously to do annual checkups. Because think about this, like for six hours a year, you just buying. I mean, different, if you look at the different statistic and, and it's, it does depend from your mortality risk, uh, anywhere from five to 25 extra happy and healthy years of your life. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. a good deal. It's important. It's important. Yeah, no, that, that's remarkable. And I'm so glad you raised that. Now you said there were also, there was also a second group of advice yeah. that you were going to share with us. You said yeah, this so was the boring thing, yeah, yeah. stuff, right? So the, the oh, boring stuff. Help? Boring stuff, yes, you know, do your checkup. This is super important. Not sure about Alzheimer and neurogenerative disease. We're still at very early stage in terms of understanding, you know, right. where it derives from. But in the end of the day, you just go to any proper hospital and you'll, you'll be in a good hands and, you know, uh, uh, taken care of in terms of annual checkup. And, and the then, second place? And, yeah, and in terms of the second place, uh, the, you know, we do invest in a number of technologies and, and the one which I'm particularly excited on is one is gene editing and gene therapy. Mm -hmm. There's so many things which is currently under development in terms of the, you know, cancer, you know, fighting the cancer or any other like orphan disease. We call them rare disease, but if you combine all the people who are suffering from rare or rare genetic disease on earth, it's 300 million people. And it's amazing. It's like, it's almost like 5% of the world population. So I think gene editing and you know, genetic engineering is super promising. There's obviously, it's just a lot of ethical aspects behind yeah. that. But, you know, um, yeah. once we solve it in the next 10 to 20 years, I think we'll be able to, you know, to help, you know, people with, you know, genetic, who are unlucky in genetic uh, lottery to live normal life and normal years as well. So then, and obviously, you know, you've seen this uh, news back in 2017, they did an experiment in China and they created twins who were unable actually to suffer from HIV. They were genetically uh, modified to avoid now, HIV. Now that is gene editing, right? 
Yeah. Or yeah. is that gene therapy? What's the difference? Yeah. Well, it's, it's so basically to create gene therapy, you do you know editing of the gene of particular proteins. It's almost like you in in most of the cases you take particular cells from this particular patient and then you you know by do gene editing you create like a therapy for this particular patient or for many patients. So that's this is your way to create the drug against that. Yeah. Wow. So, and and That's genome, exciting. got it. And then gene editing targets disease-causing genes to correct or remove defect permanently. Yeah, exactly. So that's so the beauty of that. If you have a history Look. of diabetes or cancer, gene editing would allow a medical professional to go in and remove yeah. the gene yeah. that causes exactly. that. Yeah. That's um, incredible. That's incredible. And this could be done on adults? Yeah, it's, I mean, it can be done with adults, with kids, you know, wow. even with embryos. But That's exciting. be careful here. It is. Um, I think it's just another 10, 20 years before it will become a mass product. Because this... Uh, because, so, so yeah, go on, please. Yeah, I'm sorry, Sergey. It's because we are speaking from across the world. We sometimes have a one, or one second overlap over each other's voice. Um, it's, it's because, I mean, it's just something we have to deal with. So I apologize for all of you listening. If we sometimes talk over each other, we're trying to do the best with lagging internet speeds. That's happening right now yeah. uh, because so many people are stuck at home on the web and the fact that we are across the planet. Sergey, my question to you is, let's talk about the medical science, right? What, how I, I heard from Stephen Kotler, I was speaking to Stephen Kotler earlier today. He said that as of today, there are 42 vaccines being tested for coronavirus. Yeah. Last week I was speaking to him, it was 40 vaccines. So this is obviously growing. But, what, but knowing what you know as an investor in this field, when do you think we will have a vaccine for this? Uh, well, uh, again, to tell you the truth, I think we're so desperate to have it like tomorrow or in a three month yeah. time. I think we will be lucky to have it by the same time next year. Wow, lucky will, to have it by yeah, the same time. Next this year. would require a lot of work from everyone, from the industry, from academics, from you know people who are who will volunteer to go through the trial and through regulator as well. And this is assuming like everything will will work and mm -hmm. and is super paced. So, what do you think is going to happen? Are we going to be stuck in quarantine for the next one year? Um, look. It's a very difficult question and no one knows the answer. I can give you my wild guess, but you, know, you guys forgive me if, if I'm wrong. Um, yeah. uh, I think if, if you look at the venues to tackle coronavirus, there's kind of three options here. So one is vaccines, exactly what we just discussed with you. The other one is creating a new drug. You know, it's not vaccine, it's a drug that you, that you can use to treat you know, people who are suffering from that. And creating the new drug is a huge exercise. It's multi-billion, you know, many years thing. And, and there's avenue number three, which I, you know, I think particularly promising, is repurposing current drugs to tackle coronavirus. And there's just a lot of experiments going today in the world, you know, in, in labs, in academics, in, in big pharma, but also in experiments by using artificial intelligence. So what are the drugs that we have today in our pharmacies, which are produced today and approved today, which we can use to tackle coronavirus? And I think if you want to be like super positive, then I think it might, it, we might have a chance to discover something in the next you know, three to six months, which would be helpful in terms of treating coronavirus as, as disease. And that's... Now, what I, I was just watching the news and, and Trump keeps touting this drug over and over and over again. Yeah. What's going on there? Uh, look, there's, there's so many drugs that you can replace. Hydrochloric, hydrochloroxine. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know what, what you know, this particular substance are against that. But like, what I know, there's a number of drugs against malaria, right. which you can repurpose. Um, you know, I spent six months in Africa, you know, I was strategic consultant with McKinsey. And when I've been offered the chance to take anti-malaria drug, the, the side effects of it is like a small book, right? I actually choose not to take it because 
it's it's wow. at least the version that we had back in 2005 it was super toxic with a lot of really negative almost like suicidal you know um uh, side effects by this time so that's 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 one what i know the other so one is so and in other words anti-malarial drugs like hydrochloroxine have a purpose if you have malaria because you're gonna freaking die if you don't take it yeah but if it's, you're just it's taking the it, binary it yeah. massive side effects yeah and so, I'm, I'm just checking that um the hill just published a study saying it saying it alleviated symptoms but did not cure coronavirus in a small study yeah 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 so, so then, that's not going to be much hope there the other option that i i've heard of is the drugs which you use to treat hiv sorry could you just say that again as i was turning off the page trump's voice yeah. came yeah. <laughs> Go on. It's everywhere right um so the other drug that i've heard of is a drug that used and and currently is used to treat hiv yeah so that's that's the other uh thing and it's and i'm pretty sure there's more there's um tens of different drug candidates which is currently yeah. being tested for repurposing against coronavirus so and so so i i I, I don't want to get into a medical conversation because I really believe that people should listen to their doctor, to scientists, yeah, to, and hopefully you are in a country where you have a government where your leader is listening to scientists and doctors. We can't necessarily say that about all countries right now, but I do want to raise a question to you. Every time I do a podcast interview and the subject of vaccines comes up, there's this curious American phenomenon yeah. where a large chunk of people believe yeah. that vaccines are bad, evil, or can cause autism. Yeah. What would you say to that? Because I see this type of like comments below every, every video. It, yeah. it goes into this, 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 um, this debate. What are your... So my thoughts on that. Uh, mm -hmm. Look, I think the reason um, we couldn't appreciate vaccines today, and it's the reason behind anti-vaccine movement, is right. that we're so used to collective immunity that we all have yeah. against this disease, right? And the unfortunate reality is that if anti-vaccine movement will grow in the next 10 to 20 years, it's going to be a few other epidemias or pandemias similar to coronavirus, which will teach us to appreciate the value of vaccine, right? So if you want to have one minute answer on that, I, I think it's, it's a little bit like we're so used to live in our yeah. comfort zone that we can really appreciate what created that. Right. If you want to go into a little bit more in details, probably not today, it's not binary. I, I yeah. do believe for that, that for, I'm not medical doctor, so I'm not in a position to give you and our audience advice. Yeah. But, but basically, but basically that, that whole idea that vaccines are bad, vaccines are evil is, is bad science. Yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah, this is what I think. But then you can always be selective what which particular risk you want to target. So yeah. it's not necessarily that you have to say yes to all vaccines, but there's a number of supercritical disease that we haven't seen for decades in our life are starting to come back because come a lot back of parents, because right, yeah, because people are not getting their kids enough. Parents are deciding to yeah. opt out of this option. But like Yeah, look, and it's, it's actually it's actually very bad and it's and it's, yeah, it's, it's, a, yeah, it's, it's, it's basically human nature to believe in conspiracy theories, uh, but it's also human nature to often not understand probability, uh, yeah. not truly understand science and to jump to conclusions. But yeah. vaccines are essential. Um, and I wouldn't advise anyone to think or believe the junk science out there that says that vaccines are bad. We have to trust doctors, scientists. There's so many good people out there doing their job to help help save lives. And especially when a vaccine for coronavirus comes out, I, you know, the reason we don't have a vaccine now is because it goes through such rigorous clinical trials, exactly. right? It takes exactly. years. There are 42 possible vaccines right now, but it takes, but they study these for over a year. Um, and we only hope that some of them end up being successful with no serious side effects so that we can treat COVID-19. Yeah. So on that, thank you so much for joining us, Sergey. We have reached the end of this hour. It was great having you, and thank you for this wonderful conversation. Now, where can people find out more about you? It's sergeyyan.com or my kind of Facebook page on LinkedIn. But sergeyyan.com is the best place. Yes.
S E R G E Y Young dot com. Right. Awesome. Go check Perfect. out Sergey Young at sergeyyoung.com. And uh, what is the name of your investment fund that invests in new technologies? Yeah, it's called Longevity Vision Fund. It's called Longevity Vision Fund. And uh, we established in fund. New York. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you, Sergey. And Sergey's book is called Growing Young, a step-by-step -step guide to living long and healthy. Learn about the book on Sergey Young. Remember, there's two Y's in that domain, S-E-R-G-E-Y-Y-O-U-N-G.com. Thank you, Sergey. It was great having you as a guest here. Cheers. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Take care, guys.